Good evening. We're going to begin this evening the study of hermeneutics. This to me is one of the most exciting classes that I think you could ever study in a Bible college. This class covers how we interpret the Bible. A lot of people have terrible problems with understanding how to interpret their Bibles. They don't know the basic rules and they get things all wrong. You know, we used to joke when I was young in the ministry about someone who preached a sermon, many are cold and a few are frozen. Because he misunderstood the words, many are called and a few are chosen. And we've actually heard sermons, and I'm sure that some of you have as well, where the person went completely off the beam. Doctrinally, his message was just a shambles. And he would take a verse and try to make it say something that it didn't say. Sometimes even saying exactly the opposite of what was in the verse. Well, that's a lack of hermeneutics. And in fact, oftentimes when we're talking about hermeneutics and we listen to a message, amongst pastors that practice good hermeneutics, you will oftentimes hear them say, as they will to me, Mike, the real problem with that message was that it had a bad hermeneutic. That is, the person didn't have an idea in the world how to interpret the Word of God. Now, hermeneutics actually is a Greek term. Hermeneutics we have in English now because we call this doctrinal study the study of hermeneutics. And that means interpretation, biblical interpretation. But the word hermeneutics has its etymology in the name of the Greek god Hermes. Hermes, or as we call him in English, Hermes, or Mercury, was the name of the messenger god of the Greeks. In Greek mythology, Hermes was the one who would bring the messages from the gods down to men and cause them to understand the messages. So if they heard thunder and they had no idea what that thunder meant, it was Hermes in Greek mythology who would explain that thunder means that Zeus is mad at you or whatever. Now Paul was called Hermes or Hermes, as it is pronounced in Greek, in Acts chapter 14, verse 12. It says, And they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius, because he was the chief speaker. Now you notice that it translated it into English, Mercurius or Mercury, the messenger god of the Romans, but if you look at the Greek there, you will see that it says Hermain, which is, of course, the object form in Greek. Hermes is the nominative form, the subjective form, where Hermain in Greek is the object of the verb. They called him, so it now becomes the object of the verb, his name Hermain which is Hermix in English or Hermes in Greek. Now for that reason, Hermes came to be identified with interpretation. The Greek word for interpretation that you find over and over and over in your Bible is the word Hermeneuo. Hermeneuo is found, for instance, in John chapter 1, verse 42, and he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation. Heard me know. Which is by interpretation, a stone. So the Greek word which is to interpret. It is the verbal form of it. 
is found here in John chapter 1 verse 42 as it is in other places. Uh, for instance, 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 20 to 21. He says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. It's not a private hermeneutic. It is not up for you to interpret the Bible the way that you want to. You know that oftentimes religions will do that, false cults. He says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So where does the word hermeneutics come from? Well, it comes from the Greek word. Hermeneuo. Which is to interpret. But, Hermeneuo. Has its etymology in the name of the Greek god Hermes. Hermes. He was the Greek messenger god that we call Mercury. Okay? If we were having taken this from Latin, it might have been, for instance, Mercuritic, to talk about the ability to interpret. But of course, our New Testament was written in Greek, not in Latin. So we have the word hermeneutics. This was the common word for interpretation, which being translated or interpreted. That was part of Hermes' job, to translate or to interpret what the gods were saying. So the Greek word interpretation borrows from his name. And that's the word that the Holy Spirit chose to use in the scriptures to talk about interpretation. So that is the title of this class, and it is the title of this doctrine which has to do with interpreting the Word of God. There are many different principles that are involved. We're going to look at one after another of the principles. Now, I've tried to organize them. Oftentimes in classes and hermeneutics, what you will find is that the student is presented with all of the principles and the rules, and he doesn't know how they relate to each other. So that it ends up being a jumble. In other words, when we talk about the principle of figurative language, well, which one of the rules does that have to do with? And they'll talk about that that way without identifying it as being a sub-point, a principle of one of the rules. There are seven different rules of biblical interpretation that we're going to look at. Now, I would suggest that you go right now all the way to the end of your syllabus, and you will notice that chapter 8, chapter 8 in your book covers a practical exercise in hermeneutics. That is, you are given a passage, and we're all going to work on the same passage, and you are asked to actually go through that passage and interpret it using every one of the rules of biblical interpretation. Now, I have already done, I think, the first two rules of biblical interpretation, and I did not do a thorough job on purpose, because I want you to add to those. And I want you to take what I have done there and then expand it. Go through all the different rules that you're going to be presented in these next weeks. And I want you to interpret that passage. It's just one passage. I want you to understand something. There are 66 books in the Bible. Thousands of verses. Hundreds of chapters. Just Moses alone wrote about as much as we have in the entire New Testament. Okay? 
every one of those verses needs to be interpreted before you teach on it. And a thorough understanding of your Bible is absolutely necessary so that you can compare Scripture with Scripture and come out with a valid interpretation. I can remember shortly after having been saved and I was in college studying, there was a group of students who started hitting each other in the back and beating each other. And I said, what are you guys doing? And they said, well, we're paying for our sins. Because the Bible talks about the bruises. He was bruised for our iniquities. So we're bruising each other to pay for our iniquities. And I said, you guys honestly think that's the way to pay for your sins? And they said, have you got a better interpretation? I said, yeah. With his stripes we are healed. Let me get out a whip and start beating you. Or how about by the shed blood of Christ? Let me start cutting you. And they said, oh, no, you know, what in the world are you thinking of? And I said, that's exactly what I'm asking you is what in the world are you thinking of? I couldn't tell them a verse that would say at that point in my life, that they were absolutely wrong, and they were absolutely wrong. But I knew enough to know that what they were doing didn't have the idea of the flow of the scriptures behind it. So we're actually going to look at the rules that the Bible itself lays out for us on how to interpret the Bible. The very first rule is that which we found there in 2 Peter 1, 20 to 21. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The first principle flows out of this particular verse. And that one is that the scriptures are their own best interpreter. So therefore the first rule is we believe in literal interpretation because the Bible itself interprets itself. Are all of you understanding why I came to that conclusion? If it's not a private interpretation, then who does the interpreting? The Bible itself, right? So that very principle that we get from 2 Peter 1.20, that it's not private interpretation, it's not up to me to tell you, well, the Bible says this. No, my job is to show you what the Bible says. And the Bible does its own good job of interpreting itself. And how does it do that? By literal interpretation. That's our first rule. We interpret the Bible literally because the Bible is its own best interpreter. Therefore, we don't have to imagine. It's not by imagination. It's not private. It's a literal interpretation. I hadn't been saved very long when I was a student at CSUN. And medical doctor there was a very, very close friend of mine. In fact, he paid my first year through college. Paid my books and my inscription, which came to a lot of money in those days, $150. Believe it or not, I know that doesn't sound like a terrible amount of money today, but $150 to me could have been $5,000, $10,000. In fact, later, 
when I went to Bob Jones University and it was $3,000. That didn't even seem to me as hard to imagine getting as that first $150 for my schooling at CSUN. We were talking afterward and I sat in his office and a very, very close friend of mine and he said to me, Mike, how do you believe that you're going to get to heaven? And I said, well, the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And he said, but how can you take that literally? He said, because the Bible's full of parables and all kinds of other things, right? And I said, yes. So he said, well, can you explain to me literal interpretation? That's what we're going to attempt to do tonight. I couldn't really do an adequate job with the doctor because I was too young in the faith. I was a college kid. I was probably 19, 20 years of age. And I didn't really have an idea yet about how to define these things. Now, let me give you what I had to ponder for years and years, and by the time I was able to really properly defend literal interpretation, the doctor was dead. Figurative language. Does the Bible have figurative language? Of course it does. It has figurative language. Well, how do we interpret figurative language? We interpret it literally as figurative language. Do you all understand that point? If the Bible says it's a figure, then we say literally it's a figure. Now Jesus, when he was talking about Lazarus in Abraham's bosom, was that figurative language? No. How do we know? Because he said there was a man named Lazarus. He doesn't say it's like a tree. When he says it's like a tree, we understand it's figurative, right? Because the language itself is figurative. So let's look at what is figurative. What does figurative language mean? In the first place, Parables. Parables are figurative language. The parable is a form of figurative speech where a known truth from the physical world is compared to something that we don't know about in the spiritual world, to truths that are spiritual or heavenly truths. So when you have a parable, it always takes a known truth, something that we know exists, and it compares it to something that we don't know about. And the Bible always tells us that it's a parable. Look at this. Matthew 13, 3 to 9. And he spake many things unto them in parables. Is he trying to make you think that these are literal? Or is he trying to take something and make a known truth into an unknown truth that is a spiritual truth? So you look at it. Saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them, but other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some an hundredfold, 
some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now, we have a parable. How do we interpret it? Well, the first thing we do is we interpret it as a parable. We don't say Jesus was talking about a specific man who was sowing seeds. Instead, he took a known truth that people sow seeds. And sometimes when they're throwing the seeds out, some of those seeds fall on stony ground. Some of them fall amongst thorns. Some of them are eaten by the birds that fall by the road and so forth, where the earth is too hard to let the seed germinate. These are known physical truths. Now, does he ever compare them then to spiritual truths? Yeah. Verse 18. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. Okay, now what is the earth in the parable? What is the earth in the parable? The mind, the heart of a person. The heart of a person. That's the earth. Okay, this is now the spiritual truth. What is the seed? The word of God. The word of God. Do you all see that so far? He tells you. The Bible is its own best interpreter. It's literal interpretation. We're interpreting it literally as a parable. And then he says, This is he which received seed by the wayside. Okay? He describes that person. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word. What was the seed now? The word of God. The word of God. And anon, with joy, receiveth it. Yet hath he not root in himself. So the word, he heard it, he was glad about it, but it found nowhere to grow in him. Do we all understand that? But dureth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth, okay... Now this is the stony places. Ariseth because of the word, by and by, he is offended. Didn't have any root in him. He also that received seed among the thorns. Now he talks about the thorns and he says, He that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. And he becometh unfruitful. Now he talks about the thorns. The other were the stones. Now he talks about the thorns. And the thorns that he talks about here are the care of this world. That means all the worries that we have in this world. And the deceitfulness of riches. I was talking with a man about the gospel one day. And I said... Wouldn't you like to know that you're on your way to heaven right now? He said, no, I'd like to know that I had something to eat right now. And I said, well, tomorrow you'll be hungry again. He said, yeah, and then I'll be worried about what I have to eat tomorrow. And I said, so there's never going to be any time that you have time to find out about where your soul's going to spend eternity. He said, no, I'm too worried about right here and right now. Hmm. Did Jesus talk about a man like that? That's the guy who the cares of this world choke the word of God. Okay? That's a thorn. It's a deceitfulness of riches. Then he goes on and he says in verse 23, But he that received the seed into the good ground, what was the ground again? The heart. the heart is he that heareth the word. So the way to our heart is through the ear. 
We have to hear the word and understandeth it. I've had people say to me, nowhere in the Bible does it say you have to understand the gospel. You just have to believe it. And I say, hey, how can you believe something you don't understand? Is it possible to believe in something that you don't even understand what you're believing? You could end up believing in Buddha because you didn't understand what was being said. I talked with a woman one day, I spent hours with her in Guarani, and I said to her that you have to believe that God's Son came down from heaven and died in your place on Calvary. And when I finished talking with her about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, she had this look like, I said, Madam, is there something you don't understand? And she said, yes, always knew that God had a mother, but I never knew he had a son. And now I'm going. <laughs> I couldn't believe that I'd spent all that time talking to someone who was incapable of believing the gospel message because they didn't understand it. They didn't understand. How can you believe in a Christ that you didn't even know that God had a son? You knew he had a mother, but you didn't know he had a son. She looked at me and she said, do they teach that in the Catholic Church? And before I could answer her, she said, it wouldn't matter because the Mass is all in Latin anyway. The Mass wasn't in Latin, it was in Spanish, but she didn't speak Spanish either. Could have been Latin to her. All she spoke was Guarani. And I left very frustrated that I had spent all that time and thought I had done an eloquent job of explaining the Gospel to her to have her ask me if God had a son. You see, he says here, he heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. So we interpret parables how? Well, we interpret a parable as figurative language for what it is. It's a parable. We say, yes, it's a parable. We interpret it as a parable. We don't interpret it that literally we've got to go stick seed in somebody's ear, right? That's what some people, when they criticize us for literal interpretation, they think what we're saying is you got to stick seed in somebody's ear. No. Or we got to cut them open and stick it in their heart. That's not the point at all. In a parable, each of the known truths of the physical world parallels a known truth in the spiritual world. And by the way, what a parable doesn't say, we leave alone. Okay? Did Jesus ever tell us, for instance, what we very well know from the physical world? You have to have rain on the crops, right? And you have to have sunlight. Right? Did he ever bring that up in the parable? No. Therefore, we don't bring it up. We don't say, well, the sunlight here represents... Because Jesus never told us that. That's literal interpretation. We leave out what Jesus left out. Do you understand what I'm saying there? We don't talk about the rain. We don't say, okay, now you've got to water it. We don't talk about the sunlight. We don't talk about clouds. We don't talk about the brand of fertilizer he was using. None of those things are in the parable. Jesus talks about certain things. And those are the things we talk about in the parable. Those things that can be interpreted because they're given to us. Now sometimes we have parallel parables. That is, Matthew's 
accounting of the sower and the seed may be slightly different. Maybe Luke gives us more details. We can go to Luke's gospel, use that parable, and say, see here, it tells us more. That's fine. No problem. But you can't go to imagination to interpret a parable. There's already as much imagination in the parable as God wanted you to have. You can't tell me the kind of thorns that were growing there. Say, these are the exact same kind of thorns that I had behind my house when I was a kid. You don't know that because it doesn't tell you. You can only interpret what it says. Are we all clear on that? That's figurative language. That's a parable. We have another kind of figurative language. Metaphors. A metaphor is a form of speech where something is spoken of using a word or phrase that normally describes something else. Okay? It's a figurative language, it's a form of figurative language where we use something to describe something in a person or action or a thing that normally would describe something else. For instance, I have here Hebrews 6.19, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which entereth in to that within the veil. Does your soul have an anchor? Well, not literally. Okay? I don't want you to imagine your soul in you as a blob that has a chain and an anchor stuck somewhere. Okay? But Paul here uses this figure of speech to try to get us to understand how hope acts within us. The word hope is like an anchor for the soul. Hope is sure and steadfast. You see, it's not like the word hope in English where we say, I hope so, right? Is so-and-so coming over to your house later? I hope so. And that means we're not sure about it at all. But the biblical word hope is like an anchor for the soul. It keeps the soul from moving so that your soul doesn't go adrift and end up believing in Buddha. The one who's truly saved his soul is anchored to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's hope. Okay? If you want a definition of hope, that's it. But you must not think that this is literal. It's not literal. It's figurative language. It's drawing a picture for you to help you to understand what the word hope means. Everybody understand me on that. Any questions? Isaiah 46. The voice said, Cry. And he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. Huh. How many metaphors did you find there? How many metaphors did you find? Two. Two? Okay, which two did you find? Flesh is compared to grass. Flesh is compared to grass? And the flower to goodliness. Goodness. The goodliness of the flesh, that is, how good it looks, you know? You see, see a teenager and you say, man, he sure is looking good. You see a 65-year-old pastor who's all bald and you say, he doesn't look so good anymore. Mm -hmm. 
his flower has kind of wilted, okay? Yeah, the goodliness of it, and by the way, if you marry somebody for their looks, you're marrying them for the wrong reason, because nobody looks that good when they're 65, okay? Everybody, if you hope to actually live long enough to, to enjoy life, someday you'll look old and decrepit, okay? Just take a look at your grandparents and you know. Your great-grandparents, whatever. So he compares those two, but there's another one here. The voice. Okay? It's as if he's saying that it's a voice talking. Yet the voice is actually what's being said. The voice said, cry. And he said, what shall I cry? It's using another metaphor there, speaking of God as the voice. So you have three metaphors in this particular verse. Just in this verse. Do you all see those metaphors? Where something that normally speaks of something else. Usually, if I'm talking about you, I don't call you voice. I call you Mike or John or Harry or whatever your name is. But he just calls God here voice. And then, of course, he calls flesh grass. And then he calls the goodliness, the good looks of flesh, as the flower of grass. Doesn't last very long. Yes? I'm um, sorry, you're saying the voice? represents God? Yes, God is speaking. Um, then I just have a question, because here it says cry, it's capitalized. So does that say, does that mean anything, or was, was that just a typo? No. No, commonly in the King James, when you have, what we would have quotation marks today, they begin it with a capital. Oh, okay. In other words, what the voice said was, cry. That was the message. And then the voice said, what shall I cry? So you see what is also capitalized. And then the answer, of course, is capitalized. All flesh is grass. So, yeah, you have here three metaphors. Three different metaphors. Yes? Um, I have a question. And the next one says similes, blah, 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 blah. It talks about, it's introduced with the word as. And here it says, and all the goodness thereof is a, as the flower of the field. So doesn't that make that a simile instead of a metaphor? We're going to look at that in a moment, okay? Understand that in the first place when we're talking about a metaphor, a metaphor takes something that usually speaks about something else. And it makes it to speak about something different, okay? So voice, grass, flower of the field. Those usually speak about something else, not usually about what they're talking about here. And we'll get to the difference because similes and metaphors are very similar. But we'll get to that in just a moment. Psalm 100, verse 3. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. What's the metaphor? People and sheep. Sheep of his pasture. That entire phrase there, sheep of his pasture, because actually then it's telling you that his care, what he does to care for his sheep, is the pasture. So you have two different metaphors in this one metaphor actually. Sheep of his pasture. Now we've talked about metaphors. We talk about similes now. The difference between a metaphor and a simile, and we weren't yet to similes, so we weren't going to talk about like and as. But oftentimes, not always, 
not always, but oftentimes we have similes being introduced by the word like. He is like a tree planted by rivers of water. We're going to look at that one. Okay? It doesn't say he is a tree. If it said he is a tree, that would be a... Not all at once. What would it be? Like. If God said he is a tree, what would that be? That would be a metaphor. Since it says he is like a tree, then it is a simile. It's drawing similar characteristics. Oftentimes that's introduced by the word like or as, but not always. Not always. Dissimilar things, so that it's very much like a metaphor in this respect. A metaphor describes something with using a word or phrase that normally describes something else. A simile does that too, but it compares it. It compares it. Dissimilar things, things that are not similar at all, are made to show their similarity. That's a simile. So it is also a figure of speech. Psalm 1 verses 3 and 4. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Now, do you, do you see any metaphors in here besides the similes that are very obvious? What's that? Is it that he bringeth forth his fruit in his season? Yeah, it talks about him bringing forth fruit. And... And it also talks about the rivers of water, the nourishment. It also talks about the wind driving away. It doesn't say which is like the wind that drives away. Okay? So we have at least two similes here where it talks about like a tree, like chaff. Do you see those? And those are brought out by the word like. The word as also is used. So that back in Isaiah 40 verse 6, where it said all flesh is grass. Where that is quoted in the New Testament, in 1 Peter 1.24, it says for all flesh is as grass. He's quoting from the Old Testament, but he takes a metaphor from the Old Testament and makes it a simile in the New Testament. Can you see what happened there? He doesn't say that all flesh is grass anymore. In the New Testament, Peter says all flesh is as grass. And the glory of man, which he takes all the goodliness thereof, and he calls it the glory of man. Now, he says, as the flower of grass. As the flower of grass. So he makes it likewise, as it was in Isaiah 40, verse 6. Since we hadn't gotten to similes yet, I left that alone. But... There, we talked about it as being a metaphor. It's actually a simile, yes. Now that we're in similes, and you see that he took one metaphor from the Old Testament, made it a simile in the New Testament. That's why I say they're very, very similar in their aspect. But one tells you that you are something. It's like saying, your head is a rock. Nothing gets into it. Okay? And somebody else will say your head was like a rock. 
You were so hard-headed you wouldn't listen to anything. Okay? Both express the same idea. But one of them compares, instead of saying your head is a rock, it says your head is like a rock. Now, Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep. There you have another simile. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. So we've taken a look now at three different kinds of figurative language. Parables. Who can tell me the definition of a parable? What does a parable do? It's figurative speech. It's a figure of speech where what? It takes uh, physical, known physical truth. <coughs> known truth from the physical world and compares it to spiritual, spiritual truths that we didn't know before. Okay? Then we have a metaphor. Metaphor is a figure of speech. How do we treat it? where we call something, we actually call something with a word that normally describes something else. Like calling hope an anchor for your soul. Calling your flesh grass. Doesn't say that you were smoking grass. Okay? It says your flesh is grass. Simile. A simile compares two dissimilar things without actually calling you that. Oftentimes that phrase is introduced by a the word -like. What word? As -like. like or as. as. Okay. Very well, we're going to get back into our class right now, and we're going to start with metonymy. We've had a lot of discussion going on in the class and questions about grammar and so forth, and how do we actually literally interpret things. We've, even during this break, been talking about the ten virgins and how that parable has to do with, to be interpreted as far as understanding the doctrinal issues that are involved there. Of course, some would interpret that, that the church is going through the tribulation. Others say, no, that's dealing with Israel. But the honest truth of the matter is that most of the preachers that I hear didn't even realize that the parable actually is talking about ten men. There's no way that you could properly interpret that parable if you did not understand that these are not ten women out there waiting for a man. These are ten men. These are his bodyguards. You see, the, the whole parable actually becomes twisted when we don't understand all the rules of grammar. So the next thing that we talk about here is metonymy. Metonymy. Metonymy is a form of speech in which a name or word is changed. Now the word changed comes because of the word meta. Meta in Greek. Change. For instance, metaneo. Change mind. Change your mind. That's repentance. Metamorphosis. A change of the visible form in which you see something. Caterpillar goes into a cocoon and he comes out a butterfly. That was a metamorphosis, change. So you have meta, which means change, and metonymy. And then you have nimi, which has to do with name. You change the name for another name or another word. Now we have a lot of illustrations of this. On Sunday, we were talking about them reading the book of the law. 
And we gave several other names for that. What are other names for the book of the law? Pentateuch. Pentateuch. The law of Moses. The law of Moses. The Torah. Okay? In Hebrew, the Torah. We have several other names. And in the New Testament, they do too. It says in Luke 16, 29, Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Well, did they have Moses there? Were they carrying Moses around? No. What was it that they had? The book. They had the book of Moses. They had the law of Moses. They had Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They had the prophets. They had Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, the book of Jeremiah, the book of Lamentations. They had the Psalms of David. So Abraham here says they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. So what is the metonymy here? The word prophets to mean the books of the Bible that were written by prophets. The word Moses to mean the book of the Bible, which is the Pentateuch or the Torah, which was written by Moses. Okay, that's a metonymy. So the word metonymy is interpreted literally. We don't say, well, that means literally that they had Moses there. They were still carrying his body around thousands of years after he died. No, that isn't what it means. It means that they had the writing of Moses, the writing of the prophets, and they needed to listen to what the Bible says. Literally, Moses and the prophets together means the Old Testament. Okay? The Old Testament. So we have here a metonymy. The writer of the book is identified as the book. Okay? We'd say, well, what does Jeremiah say? We even say that till today, right? What did Jesus say? And then we quote Matthew's gospel. Well, we're talking about a book and changing the name of that book to either the name of the writer or to something that he quoted. We have another metonymy in Romans 13 4 for he is the minister of God to thee for good but if thou do that which is evil be afraid for he beareth not the sword in vain for he is the minister of God a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil okay what is our metonymy here the sword. And what does the word sword mean? What is it a metonymy for? What is it a change of name that represents? Government. Government's power to punish evil. We would call that police, a judicial system, the army, all of those things. Today we would talk about it as being prison and all. Although they did not have prisons in Israel. Okay? Punishment there was meted out and that was the end of it. So that you were beaten with with a rod or something like that and you go home and now you work. And if you stole 50 bucks you had to pay back not only that fifty dollars but twenty percent. That was your punishment. So the punishment there wasn't to make somebody sit in a cell for the rest of his life. Punishment in Israel was you were punished at the moment, and then you were told, now you have to restitute to the person that you just hurt. If you stole $50 from them, you got to add 20% on top of it and pay them back. Now that kind of punishment I like. Because the person who was injured actually gets his money back. You know, in our society, you steal $50 from somebody and you go to jail, they say, well, you paid for your crime. 
Well, what about the poor guy who lost his 50 bucks? Okay? I'd rather have the guy be out and be able to work and pay me back. Instead of saying, well, he paid for his debt to society. Forget that. In the Bible, the guy was left free. He had to support his children and his wife, right? If he's in jail, who's supporting his wife and children? And how's that helping me if he stole my $50? I don't know if you guys follow what I'm saying, but that was biblical justice. So if they determined that you were guilty of something, you paid for it right there, and that was the end of it. And you learned a lesson on top of it. I don't want to do that again, because the next time i got to pay back more than what I stole. <laughs> So, that was Moses' law. But the idea of the sword here is an idea of punishment. That government has a military and a police force that punishes crime, punishes evil. The next word that we have is synecdoche. Synecdoche is a form of speech where one part is used to represent the whole. Or at times, the whole is used to represent just a part. It is also a synecdoche when the general, speaking of the general, is used to represent the specific. Or we use a specific instance to represent the general use of something. For instance, in Genesis 3.19, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Now, how many synecdoches did you read in Genesis 3.19. Take a look at it carefully. How many of them are there in there? Okay, let's take a look at it this way. Sweat of thy face. Do you only sweat on your face? No. There, the part was used to speak about sweating. But in how much of your body do you sweat? Okay, now when you read that, did you understand the guy sitting here perfectly cool from the head down, but his face is just sweating like crazy? Or when you read it, did you think immediately that his whole body is sweating? You see, because there, the part was used to make you think of the whole body. We don't just think of somebody out there hoeing the ground and all the sweating is his face. This would be an unusual person whose whole body is air conditioned but his face is sweating like crazy. Okay, When God said the sweat of your face he was actually saying your whole body is going to sweat you are going to have to work hard and sweat. But he used a part. Do you all see that now? When I said that the specific was used for the general at times. And sometimes the general for the specific. Okay? The sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. Is bread the only thing you eat? You ever sit down and just say, man, that was the best bread I've eaten all week. You know, all I've had, you know, we usually think of bread and water as being prison food, right? I think even prisoners get better than that. No. But, no? <laughs> okay. Well, bread and water is not normally all that you eat. Bread may be part of your diet. We know 
that Adam didn't eat just bread. He was allowed to eat fruit and vegetables. He had an ample diet. He didn't have meat yet. But here bread is used to represent everything that he ate. The sweat of your face represented his whole body. The bread represents his whole diet. Now let's go on because there's more here till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art. Uh, what about dust? How about death? But dust here represents something more than just dust. Our body. body. Yeah, so we have here the particles he says, first of all, out of the ground thou wast taken. So was he just dust or was he ground? We speak of the dust because the dust comes out of the ground. It's another synoptiki. It is comparing the finite part to the whole. Okay? Dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So we found three synecdoches in this particular passage. Do you all follow that? Mm -hmm. yes. Three different ones. And by the way, if we went through the whole Bible, do you think you're going to find them all over the place? I've just picked some evident ones, okay? Nobody else wrote this. I put these notes together. But you can find these kind of things throughout the whole Bible. Throughout the whole Bible. Another one. Synecdoche in Judges 12.7. And Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then died Jephthah the Gileadite and was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. Okay, anybody got an idea what that means? How is that a synecdoche? Okay. Instead of saying he was buried in the land of Gilead without being specific, he says in one of the cities, he takes the general, he just says, it was in the cities of Gilead. And by the way, the word one was supplied by the translators. Because in English, it doesn't make any sense to say he was buried in the cities of Gilead. But what he's actually saying here is, It's out there in Gilead. <laughs> and he's using the general to actually help you to understand that it's specific, but he's not going to tell you where. He's not telling you which city. So he says, in the cities of Gilead. Do you follow me? Now, by the way, a sword also shall pierce thine own heart. What did that mean? It's what the angel Gabriel said to Mary, remember? Now with Jesus, literally, a spear pierced his side. You have another usage there of a metonymy where they're talking about the pain that she would suffer in seeing her son die, but you also have there the heart used for something that really means her whole being. Okay? Then it becomes a synecdoche. Okay? Becomes now the part, the heart compared to the whole, to her whole being. Let's move on. 
personification. This is one that's used throughout the Bible. I mean, it's amazing how many times personification is used in the scriptures. Numbers 1632. And the earth opened her mouth. Does the earth actually have a mouth? Okay. Personification is a form of speech where something inanimate is spoken of as if it were an animal or a person. And an animal at times is spoken of as if it were a person. So sometimes a dog is spoken of like he was a person, or a cow like he was a person, or a donkey like he was a person, or a sheep like he was a person. But sometimes also you have a rock or a mountain or the dirt or the sea spoken of as if it were an animal or a person. Do you follow me? Everything is upgraded. The earth itself can be spoken of as, or a mountain, or the ocean, the sea, or something, as if it were a person. And an animal can be spoken of as if it were a person. Now, how about if it's the opposite way? That's what we're going to see next. Don't get ahead of me on this, okay? Because, yes, I'll tell you right now, yes, if a person is spoken of like an animal, that's called... Uh, should I tell you already? Yes. We haven't gotten to it yet. <laughs> Let's wait till I get to it. Okay? Personification. Personification is when either the earth is spoken of as an animal or as a human being or some other inanimate object, a rock or a mountain or the sea or whatever, or when an animal is spoken of as a person. That's personification. So number 1632, the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up. The earth doesn't actually swallow, hasn't got a stomach. But it gives us an image, no? We see the earth going like that and people falling down into it now on top of them, right? It gives us an image, but it's not actually a mouth and it's not swallowing. That's personification. And their houses. And, and that really, the word houses there really was tents. And all the men that appertained, that means were associated unto Korah, and all their goods. So we have personification. Psalm 114, verses 3 and 4. The sea saw it. You picture two eyeballs coming up out of the sea? Okay. And fled. Jordan was driven back. The mountains skipped like rams. And the little hills like lambs. Okay? You ever see rams skipping? I have in Israel. Okay? Jumping and skipping as they went up the side of a mountain. Okay? He says, and if you can imagine a flock of rams going up a mountain, and they're going like that. That's the picture that he's drawing for you of what the mountains look like. He saw the mountains going like that. For those of us that were here in 1994 when we had the Northridge earthquake, we saw the mountains skipping like rams. And I could see houses that looked like they were on the ocean. So the whole earth was going like this, like waves coming at you. So yeah, it draws a picture for us of what he was seeing. When they saw Israel leaving Egypt and crossing over the Red Sea and then crossing over the Jordan, he said, the sea saw it. 
<laughs> and fled. And the mountains, they were skipping like rams. Okay, and the hills like little lambs. This personification. He's attributing to an inanimate object things that would seem like he's talking about a human being or an animal. Okay? Then we have a form of personification which is called apostrophe. Apostrophe. This is a form of personification where instead of talking about the mountain skipping like rams, he actually talks to the mountains. Where God directly speaks to the earth, to the sea, to the mountains. And he speaks directly to them. That's called an apostrophe. So we see that in 1 Corinthians 15, 55. An example of it. O death. Now Greek has a tremendous thing that it does. In Greek, when you actually talk to someone, you directly talk to someone, then they are marked as the person being addressed in Greek. The only way we have to translate it into English is we put the word O. But in Greek the word death there has an ending on it that means he's talking directly to death. Death is an inanimate object. You can't talk to it. It doesn't have ears. It doesn't have hands. It's got no will. Okay. He says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, another inanimate object that he directly talks to it as if it were a human being. This is now personification, but this type of personification where you directly speak to the inanimate object is called apostrophe. Apostrophe. O grave, where is thy victory? You ever heard in the Old Testament where God says, O oh, earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. As if the earth had ears. Okay? God will speak, he says to Babylon, O oh, thou destroying mountain, apostrophe. He speaks to Babylon, it's an inanimate object. And he says, O thou destroying mountain. So you have apostrophes and personifications all throughout the Bible. Now we come to that other one that I was talking about. It's called anti-personification. Anti-personification is when it's a form of personification, but it does the opposite. It's where God talks to a man as if he were an animal or an inanimate thing. Where God talks to a man as if he were a rock, or as if he were a mule, or as if he were a snake. And God directly addresses him in that way. Or speaks about him in that way. That's anti-personification. 2 Samuel 9, 8. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Okay? He calls himself a dead dog. By the way, do you understand what that means? Anybody got an idea? What am I? Who am I that you should talk to me? I'm just a dead dog. No value whatsoever. Does a dead dog protect your house? Does a dead dog bark? Some stranger comes by? Dead dog going to bite you? 
In other words, don't worry about me. I'm just a dead dog. I'm of no value at all. You can't kill me because I'm already dead. <laughs> I do nothing good and I do nothing bad. I'm a dead dog. There are other things that dead dog speaks of in the Bible, but that's one of the basic ideas. By the way, oftentimes Gentiles are called dead dogs. When a whole army was coming against them, and the prophet says, he's just a dead dog. He's powerless. He can't do anything to me. I trust in God. Got all these angels around me. That guy's just a dead dog. Okay? So understand, this is what we call anti-personification. It's taking a human being and then calling him something either that's inanimate, like a dead dog, or calling him something that is an animal. Hyperbole. Oh, yes, hyperbole. This is a form of speech in which exaggeration is used in order to emphasize or to give the effect. Now, when we have an exaggeration that's an obvious exaggeration, it's a hyperbole. It's where God expresses or man expresses something that goes way beyond what we know is true. And we understood that the person was exaggerating. You see, what's the difference between an exaggeration that we would call a lie and a hyperbole? Anybody got an idea? Because I've had people question me. Well, does that mean God exaggerates and he lies about things? Yes or no? No. No, God doesn't lie about things. So how do we know that it's not a lie, that it's a hyperbole? It's got to be a basic rule. Okay, let me give it to you so that you understand. Because it's important to understand. You know, my wife will say to me, Michael, did you just exaggerate that? And I'll say, if you're questioning it, no. A hyperbole, everyone knows that it's something that's being exaggerated. That's why it's a hyperbole. Okay? Everybody knows. It's not like this is a secret. An exaggeration, which we would call a lie, is intended to deceive somebody. There is an intention to deceive you. Do you follow that? For instance, pastors. We would never exaggerate. We may just tell a few hyperboles. Okay? Now I'm saying that with a smile because you go to a pastor's conference and you'll say to a pastor, so, how's the church going there? Great! We're, we're running in the thousands. He's never made it to a thousand in his whole life. Okay? But because you haven't ever been to his church, he wants to deceive you into thinking that things are better than they are. Okay? So... It could even be an exaggeration. For instance, somebody said to me, how many doctorates do you have? Oh, uh, three. That would be an exaggeration. I don't have three doctorates. 
Oh, really? What are they in? Uh, let's see. Medicine? That's a lie. See, I had to invent something. Theology? Well, that's true. <laughs> but as soon as I start going into the area where I'm trying to deceive someone, impress them, then it's not a hyperbole. Okay? If I said to my wife before we're married, I've got millions of dollars in the bank. I had to borrow a dollar from her to get married. Okay? I didn't have a cent. But if I said to her, I've got millions of dollars in the bank, that would be an exaggeration. That's not hyperbole. You follow me? But if I said to her, I'm as smart as Einstein, <laughs> well, that might be my opinion. And it might be a hyperbole. But if I'm not trying to deceive her, then it's not a lie. If she goes, nah, he's not as smart as Einstein, then I didn't deceive her. Do you follow me? It's the intent. God never intended to deceive us. So when he puts a hyperbole, it's an obvious thing. He's making a point. Does everyone follow me on that? Because this is one area, when I get into it, I always have people that have questions. Are you saying that God lies? No, I'm not saying that God lies. Because when he puts it down, he expected that we all knew that, okay, he said it that way because it was intended to impress us, not because he is overstating something and with the idea of deceiving us. Yes? What is the difference between hyperbole and exaggeration again? I'm sorry. Well, the basic word hyperbole means that it's an exaggeration. But when we say exaggeration and we call it a lie, then we're using the word exaggeration in such a way to say, you purposely tried to deceive me. And God doesn't try to deceive us. Do you understand? So, let's take a look at some examples. I think you'll understand it better when you see the examples. 2 Samuel 1.23 Saul and Jonathan were lovely and pleasant in their lives. And in their death, they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles. How swift is an eagle? Around 60 miles an hour. Do you think they ran that fast? Anybody here think that they ran 60 miles an hour? Okay, then, then do we understand this is a hyperbole? Okay, God didn't expect us to look at that and say, Man, Jonathan and, and Saul, they could run 60 miles an hour. You follow me? Nobody thought that this was to be understood as literal. It's a hyperbole. It's just trying to say they were really fast. That's all. And then he says they were stronger than lions. Now, did anybody actually think they were stronger than lions? Or did everybody hear that? Because this, by the way, is what David said. Okay? This isn't what God said. God is recording for us what David said. But did anybody think that David was trying to deceive people? Or did they understand it as sort of like a poem? He's glorifying them. He's eulogizing them. And yes, it's a hyperbole. Okay? Everybody understand me on that. Okay? There was no intent here to deceive you. Now let's take a look at the next one. Genesis 41, 49. And Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea. Very much until he left numbering, for it was without number. Anybody actually think that there was as much corn 
as the sand of the sea? No. There was no intent here to deceive. What's the comparison? It was so much, they quit counting. They couldn't count it anymore. That was the point. What he gets to when he says, until he left numbering, for it was without number. They didn't number it. They got so far into it and they were counting. One bushel, two bushels, three bushels. And they finally said, look, let's quit counting. It's like the sand of the sea. You see, who counts all the grains of sand to see? There's too many to count. And this is too much for us to count. We're not counting it anymore. That's all that it's saying. It's a hyperbole. It's not an exaggeration where it was intended to deceive you. Nobody actually thought that they counted all the grains of sand of the sea and therefore they knew that there was as much grain as there was sand of the sea. Judges 7.12 And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along in the valley like grasshoppers. Oh, really? Were they really like grasshoppers? You know, grasshoppers, an invasion of grasshoppers can, there can be, you know, who knows how many. All this just saying is, when they looked out across the valley and they saw all those Midianites, it filled up the whole valley like grasshoppers do when there's an invasion of grasshoppers. For multitude and their camels without number, as the sand by the seaside for multitude. He's giving you the impression that it was a great army. But he is not trying to tell you literally that there were as many camels as there is sand in the sea. Everybody follow me. It's a hyperbole. Nobody reads it and says, ah, I can look up on the internet how many grains of sand there are in the sea and I know how many camels there were. No, not at all. Okay? Those are hyperboles. And there is a tremendous difference between that and what we call lying. God doesn't lie. Now, he'll record lies. The devil's lies are in the Bible. Man's lies are in the Bible that God recorded for us. But God doesn't lie. So when he uses a hyperbole, he does so expecting that we know that it's a hyperbole, that it's not literal. Okay? These are figurative language forms. The last figurative language form that we're going to look at is sarcasm. Uh, by the way, Jewish people use a lot of sarcasm until today. It's one of those very popular forms that Jewish people use. Sarcasm is a form of speech which is cutting, often with irony and the intention to wound. It is a joking way of expression with the intention to make the victim look ridiculous or despised. Now that's the dictionary's definition of sarcasm. Let me just point out to you. You ever heard me say something like, evolution is a wonderful thing. Did anybody think I was actually serious? Yes, my wife. Okay, she says, honey, somebody's going to listen to you and think that you actually like evolution. And I say, nobody's going to think that. That's sarcasm. It's sarcasm. And God is sarcastic. Okay, God is sarcastic. And you find it all over in the Bible. Job 38, 4. Perfect example. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. 
That's being sarcastic. Where were you when I built the world? Have you ever heard me say anything like, the only guy that was there when the earth was created was God? <laughs> I'm being sarcastic. These guys weren't there. The evolutionist wasn't there. That's sarcasm. And God uses sarcasm. And he'll use sarcasm often in the Bible. I look at the story of Balaam. And he's riding along there on his donkey. And his donkey's talking to him. And he's talking back. You think God wasn't being a little sarcastic there with Balaam? If I had a sword in my hand, I'd kill you. And the angel of God is right there with a sword in his hand, ready to kill Balaam. Which one of them was the donkey? That's sarcasm. God was being sarcastic with him. And the sarcasm was used as a way of teaching. You're such a dummy. You know, when Moses goes in there in front of Pharaoh, and Pharaoh says, I don't ever want to see your face again. Moses said, you got that right. You're never going to see my face again. Because tonight, we're out of here. Children of Israel are going to leave. We're going to be gone. So you're right. Sarcasm. He was being sarcastic with him. You said you don't want to see me again? Yeah, you're not going to. Neither is your firstborn. He's going to be dead tonight. Sarcasm. And over and over and over again, God says to Adam, What is this that thou hast done? Sarcasm. He's being sarcastic with him. So when we go through the Bible, we see these types of of figurative language. This is the first principle and we interpret them literally. So what does literally mean? We interpret them for what they are. Literally, it's a metaphor, it's a simile, it's an apostrophe, it's sarcasm, it's a hyperbole. Whatever that thing is that we're interpreting, it's a parable. Whatever it is, we interpret it for what it is. That's literal interpretation. Because those that do not interpret a hyperbole as a hyperbole, or sarcasm as sarcasm, they're not interpreting literally. Because they're not interpreting according to the rules of grammar. Do you understand that? That's not literal interpretation. If it doesn't follow the rules of grammar, it is not literal interpretation. So our first principle a biblical interpretation is that it must be literal and under that the rule of literal interpretation it's the principle that we have learned this evening is one of figurative language is literally interpreted as what it is it's figurative language any questions Is that regarding question number 2A or 22A? Well, since I haven't got an exam here in front of me, what does 2A say? Give the seven rules of hermeneutics. No, oh, no, then uh, 2A is only the first rule. The first rule is that it's literal interpretation. Now, what is 22A? give eight principles of literal interpretation. Ah, yeah. Then we have our first principle of the first rule of interpretation. The first principle is figurative language. The principle of figurative language. Which is what we find on page 
to the principle of figurative language. And we have there the definition of that principle. That principle is that figurative language is interpreted for what it is. Okay? So we have the first principle. We have several principles that we're going to look at of literal interpretation. The very first principle is the principle of figurative language. Okay? That's still literal because we interpret it literally for what it is. Any other questions? Yes? Because um, we, as we look at it, we only have like examples where it's just sarcasm, hyperbole, and stuff like that. But is there an instance when a phrase is both a hyperbole and a simile at the same time? Oh, yes. Yeah. And so if you're going to interpret that, does one take over the other to interpret it? You use both. Oh, you use both. Right. So like they're in equal footing. If a parable has similes in it, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a simile. Okay? But it's also a parable. So, so now we have a parable which has a simile in it. Yeah, we interpret it as both. Both a parable and a simile. And if there's a hyperbole in it, and a hyperbole too. We go through all the different figurative language things because in a passage of the scriptures, and one of the things that we're going to get to is that we never take just one verse out of context. Okay? We keep a verse in its context. And that's the second rule, and we'll get to that one sometime in the future. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Figure of speech. I remember when my teacher was teaching us about figure of speech, they treated this as an irony rather than sarcasm. Is it, is it acceptable either sarcasm or irony? No. Titling this I'm, one? I'm, Something can be ironic as a part of sarcasm. In other words, there can be something ironic about it. Mm -hmm. But an irony means something slightly different than sarcasm. For instance, let me just point out one to you. Ironic. Pharaoh commanded to throw all the male children into the river. It was ironic that all his children died and the river overflowed its banks and carried them all away out of their grave. That's irony. But there's nothing sarcastic about that. Okay? It was ironic. It's ironic that the very thing that he wanted to do to the children of Israel passed on him, happened to him. It's ironic that he wanted to drown all of the children of Israel and his whole army drowned in the Red Sea. That's ironic. That's an irony. But it wasn't sarcasm. Okay? Okay. Now, often sarcasm will have irony in it as a part of what God is saying. But sarcasm is one thing, irony is another. Something can be ironic and not have anything sarcastic about it at all. Sarcasm. When God says, you're going to eat flesh till it comes out your nose. That's sarcasm. Okay. The irony of it is that they wanted to go back to Egypt to eat flesh and they had flesh in the desert and it killed them. That's irony. There's a difference between irony and sarcasm. Do all of you understand that difference? Very well. We're going to leave it right here for tonight.
Now at the end of your book, you will notice that on page 57, your last chapter, which is a chapter on an exercise in hermeneutics, you are to apply all of the different rules and principles that we have found. Now you'll notice that I have at least listed them for you there so that you can easily do this exercise. I have pages 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, and half of page 63 already filled in. But then from there, I want you to actually take these particular verses that I've asked you to interpret and begin right now with the different rules that you have of interpretation and begin to fill them in. Make sure that you fill them in completely so that your exercise looks right and do it on a separate piece of paper. Do not use the paper that's in your book. There's not enough room in your book for all of this. And then you'll be required to turn that in. That's a part of your final grade in this class. So make sure that you follow through with doing this exercise. Start now. Don't wait till the last minute. Make sure that you get it done.